Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Let's just wait a few more moments as I see people are coming in. Okay, I'll get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Senna, and I am the coordinator of the Champion Mayors for Inclusive Growth Initiative within the OECD's Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions, and Cities. Welcome to day two of Champion Mayors Week, More Inclusion, Better Recovery. In recognition of the fifth anniversary of the Champion Mayors Initiative, each day this week will feature champion mayors in dialogue on different aspects of their COVID recovery efforts and how they are working to put inclusive growth at the center. After a great start to the week with yesterday's mayor's panel on the inclusive economic recovery post COVID, today I am delighted to discuss with you with three of our champion mayors, how uh, cities, how they are building cities that will be fit for the future and reshaping it to fit our needs post pandemic. The spatial dimensions of cities are tremendously important. Uh, elements such as master plans and redevelopment projects take years of planning, preparation, resources for them to be delivered. In the best case scenario, they trigger vibrancy, growth, expand access, connect neighborhoods and communities throughout the city. In the worst case scenario, they drive inequalities, cause displacement and a sense of exclusion and are underproductive. The pandemic has acted as a catalyst for cities and their local leaders to rethink urban spaces. Discussions of the 15 minute city have circled back in response to lockdown, where some people were able to access their basic food and goods and services and necessities within their neighborhoods, while others were locked into food deserts. Actual, sit, actual streets in cities were reconfigured into sidewalk cafes and restaurants and for recreational use. Hundreds of kilometers or miles of cycling lanes have been added to city streets to provide climate friendly, uh, safe uh, options, pandemic safe options to getting around the city. But we're also waiting in anticipation for the dust to clear. What happens to our city districts, our central business districts, when workplaces that are considering and lifting up hybrid models uh, change our commuting patterns and how we use these commercial spaces and zones in the day to day. Today's discussion will be devoted to how COVID-19 has inspired local leaders to reimagine the urban space, spaces to be inclusive, sustainable, safer, yes, but also adaptive, adjustable, and responsive to future needs. How are the impacts felt uh, from COVID-19 uh, reorienting public space? What are the long-term implications and how are cities uh, changing how they build and develop and develop to be more sustainable, more inclusive, and fit for the future? To help us explore these questions, we are delighted to have us with us here with us today, three champion mayors, Mayor Matush Valo from the city of uh, Bratislava in Slovakia, Mayor Enat Kalishvatem from uh, the mayor of Haifa in Israel, and Mayor Libby Schaff, the mayor of Oakland in California. Uh, unfortunately, Mayor uh, we were to have Mayor Sam Licardo with us here from San Jose. However, um, due to an emergency situation in the city, he won't be able to join us. In this conversation, I won't be doing this alone. I have, and I'm so delighted to have with me, George McCarthy, 
or as we know him, Mac, the president and CEO of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, one of the supporting institutions of the Champion Mayors for Inclusive Growth Initiative. And with this, I give the floor to Mac to introduce himself and I will get into some housekeeping before we give, uh, we give the floor to the mayors. Mac, take it away. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, so thanks, Senna, and thanks everyone for joining us. It's uh, great to be uh, with you and to um, share a little bit um, about uh, the Lincoln Institute, but really more about um, how we feel about cities and why cities are so important to us. And I just wanna set this all into a little bit of historic context because um, for those of us who care about sustainability on the planet, it's been an interesting ride over the last, let's say about 30 years or so uh, starting in 1992 with the, the original Rio Summit on Sustainable Development, it was interesting to see that uh, cities were actually looked at as the villains. Um, you know, producers of greenhouse gases and producers of all sorts of other externalities that were threatening uh, life on the planet. But if we fast forward uh, 20 years to Rio plus 20, the, the, the second Rio conference, it was really interesting how the environmental community had come around to see that cities are actually part of the solution, not part of the problem when we think about global sustainability, because we need places that we can put people that isn't gonna uh, leave them spread over the planet and you know, uh, following up all the other natural systems and all that that we rely on for our own um, survival. So, um, and then by 2016 at the Habitat 3 conference in, in uh, Quito, Ecuador, it had become clear that people were now not just looking at cities as part of the solution, but essential, that getting uh, sustainable cities right was it gonna be essential for human habitation long-term on the planet. So we've come full circle. We've now seen cities move from being villains to being uh, the solution. And that's happened probably three or four other times in history because cities, the, the people in cities have had kind of a love-hate relationship for a long time. But for the Lincoln Institute, we care a lot about cities for another reason as well. And this is why we, we love mayors. And it's because we think that when you look at uh, levels of government, the quality of life is actually delivered to citizens by local government. And even though lots of people obsess about what happens at the national government level, we find out that if the local government is not really doing its job, um, it is immediately felt by citizens. And the local government can really define not just how um, we lead our lives on a daily basis, but can define things like our life expectancy by making the different choices as to how we actually manage the, the built environment. And so for us now, we're on the crux of yet another major transition from cities as we move out of this pandemic and we think about what we're going to do um, in response to um, COVID and all of the outgrowth of COVID. And I think that for us, it's gonna be really important to understand the thinking of some leading cities that have really thought about um, not just COVID, but all the other existential threats that, that cities uh, face and how we're going to be able to use this moment to really do um, the right thing uh, long term. So um, you'll hear more from me uh, later on, but I'm going to uh, turn it back to Senna so we can get going with the mayors because they're the ones we want to hear from. Thanks. Thanks, Mac. Well, before we get started, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, participants, this, uh, this session is being recorded and will be made available on the Champion Mayors platform next week. You can use the chat function to let us know if you're having any technical difficulty, but use the question and answer function if you'd like to direct any questions to the mayors. We'll be having a short Q&A session after the moderated discussion, and we'll be sure to try and address as many questions as possible. Uh, during this event, please feel free to engage uh, us on Twitter with the handle at OECD Local and tag Champion Mayors Week. We will now move on to our panel discussion. Each speaker will have about four minutes to provide a brief introduction uh, from their city's perspective. Um, I will then give the floor to Mac to moderate uh, the to moderate the second round of discussions. 
Uh, when I pop up on the screen, that's a sign that we're coming to the end of the four uh, minutes. But let us start with our first speaker, Mayor Matushvalo from the city of Bratislava. Uh, Mayor, you're an architect, an urban expert. Uh, Mayor Valo was also one of the founders of City Interventions Initiative, which focused on creating small and creative concepts that have generated more than 900 projects to improve uh, public spaces in 20 Slovak and Czech cities. Uh, Mayor Valo, how has the city of Bratislava been reimagining the shape of public space before and during, uh, before, during, and after COVID-19? The floor is yours. Yeah, now, thank you very much. And again, uh, thank you for having me. And I just need to uh, make a small reaction to what Max said, because that was one of the key elements, the key moments, uh, what we feel that the cities are not problem anymore. We knew that cities are solution for many years, but now I feel that in a European environment, but also in uh, in Americas, everybody understand it, and that this is one of the biggest biggest uh, let's say challenges uh, which uh, which came from from the crisis for us. So we we became uh, more in a central uh, position in uh, uh, resolving this problem. A crisis uh, made us uh, adjust many decisions, as well the, the direction of, of our project and policies. Uh, the struggle, of course, to protect the most vulnerable groups of the population, uh, while ensuring the, the running of the city was very demanding uh, in terms of our effort and funding. But it also showed us uh, what a splendid team of people ready to provide the assistance we have around us. And that was one of the very important moments of the crisis for us. Uh, it, in particular, it revealed the amazing spirit of solidarity and responsibility of Bratislavians, uh, the, the citizen of Bratislava. Uh, and the uh, corona crisis also has shown how much reliance the inhabitants place on the towns where they live, That's something I mentioned before. The helping hand of the state proved not to be sufficient in Slovakia. We admit that both the new government that took office a year ago and um, all of us were facing an unprecedented situation. We have to deal with the problems we had not been able to prepare for in advance, but we must always lay emphasis on the importance of information and its timely delivery to the people. So, uh, of course, if we are, this was a small introduction, but if we are, and today we will talk about public space, of course, not only. Uh, the, I think the most important message I have, and I think also other cities have, that public space and its absolutely pivotal uh, in importance in, in the life of our cities uh, is still there. Uh, everybody was looking forward to go back to the public space. Everybody, and this is not the first time when any kind of crisis uh, are impacting uh, the, the use and the form of public space, but what I believe as an architect that we're just going to change it in, in some way, maybe in terms of hygiene, maybe in terms of safety on some policies, but what is important that public space is still there, will be there, uh, like in the past, also in the future, and will be one of the key elements of the life of a citizen in our cities, a social, democratic, uh, and all others. So, we are ready to, to go back to the public space. I spent many months in the empty old town uh, because everybody was very disciplined and the city was empty, but now everybody's keen to go back and uh, restart our lives in public space. Thank you, Mayor Valo. It's very true. Everybody's waiting to, to get out and uh, be social responsibly, but definitely uh, use public space once again. Thank you. Our second speaker is Mayor Kalish Rotem, the mayor of Haifa. Uh, she has launched several urban renewal projects, including Haifa Riviera City, uh, Ramat Shul, and Kiryat Sprinsek 
and uh, has inherited the rehabilitation of several key uh, boulevards within the cities. You've popped up bicycle lanes uh, and bike paths throughout uh, the city. Mayor Kalish, we're excited that you've been able, uh, please tell us how you are planning to reshape uh, public space in Haifa post COVID-19. Thank you, Sana, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm uh, so excited to be here. Um, we, I, I stepped into office two and a half years ago and started uh, at once um, to uh, promote uh, all sorts of uh, urban renewal projects. Uh, and at the moment, we have around 40 very important projects uh, of um, um, low uh, social income neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods that uh, reside along the seashore uh, that we want to connect to, to the sea, of course. We have um, uh, neighbor, neighborhoods that uh, are next to the sea, but they don't have accessibility to the sea, which is crazy uh, because of uh, public uh, transportation, uh, railways and stuff like that. Uh, we started promoting a new um, um, accessibility projects and uh, public transportation and um, education and master plans and tourist master plans. So we started um, um, looking at the city in a very wide scale and large scale uh, projects. And then of course the COVID-19 uh, um, came uh, just around a year, a year and a half, uh, after starting to work on these very wide uh, and large scale projects. And then we immediately went into a short term project, uh, doing with uh, public spaces, uh, taking uh, places of parking, parking spaces and giving them to, um, putting them, uh, locating their, um, uh, desks, uh, tables, store tables and places to sit uh, for restaurants, for coffee, coffee shops. Uh, we um, initiated a food truck uh, project uh, to locate all sorts of small businesses uh, moving uh, in all sorts of places around the city. And uh, we um, brought some food trucks into the, um, uh, to the sea, uh, to the seashore. Uh, a, a place where people could be uh, without the fear of, of, of um, um, uh, getting the pandemic uh, because we needed uh, very open spaces and um, you know uh, open air and uh, clean air and uh, uh, places where people could uh, walk out. Uh, we also closed a few streets um, uh, and turned them to pedestrian streets and uh, we realized that uh, the businesses uh, started flourishing and we had all sorts of other and um, perhaps I will uh, talk afterwards um, projects to help small businesses. So uh, from thinking large scale projects we entered very uh, small and local and very ad hoc and very uh, immediate projects. And all of a sudden we realized that these are all intertwined and, and they work together. And um, we, we are willing to continue working on, this, on, the, on both levels. So that's more or less, um, and we had also a, a very big challenge to those who don't um, uh, know Haifa. It's a city of, it's a true multicultural city with uh, many religions, um, Arabs, uh, Muslims, and, and Christians, and Jews, and, and Druze, and Baha'is, and everybody's living here. So when we uh, approach to the people, uh, we have many, many um, communities here. And uh, also during the pandemic, we had to, uh, to see that they all have their places and spaces within the city. So that was a big, big challenge, but um, um, a very happy one. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kalish Roten. And reminding us that the multiple dimensionality of a public space uh, also uh, sustains us. Uh, I move to our, our third mayor, our third and final mayor, uh, Mayor Schaff. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. 
we know that you and, and Oakland have seen overseen several initiatives that are shifting the dimensions of, of public space from community cabins that address housing and homelessness to the promotion of public transport as part of uh, your climate plan and major developing projects such as the Gateway Industrial uh, District. Please, could you shed some light on how COVID-19 has provoked changes and, and how you are managing and using public space in the city of Oakland? Thank you, and, and I love your question. How did COVID provoke changes? Uh, because while COVID-19 has been so tragic, we've all suffered such losses, it also presented some incredible opportunities and liberating our roads for the people was one of the kind of silver linings of this otherwise tragic year. For those of you who don't know Oakland, California, we are part of the San Francisco Bay Area, a metro region of just under 8 million people that includes San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Oakland itself has a population of about 440,000, just under half a million. And it has some of the best weather in the world, very mild climate. And we are very proud to be one of the most racially diverse cities in America. Roughly one quarter white, one quarter black, one quarter Latino, one quarter Asian and mixed race. Uh, and, and more integration than you would find in other cities. On March 17th, the Bay Area region was the first in the United States to issue a shelter in place order. March 17th, the whole barrier shut down. And it was only three and a half weeks later that we announced one of the most ambitious slow streets programs. And I want to be honest that COVID also gave us permission as government to not be you know, as careful or as fancy as we would be during normal times. Uh, actually, some of my staff borrowed my own minivan, put you know, saw horses, traffic barriers in the back and drove around to establish Oakland's first slow streets. Not a typical public works project. <laughs> but we had just done the analysis of the traffic patterns for our entire city as part of our bike route program. So we took that data and used it to select the appropriate streets to close to through traffic so that we could immediately create safe outdoor spaces for people to recreate in close to their homes. It was amazing. Part of our commitment to racial equity in Oakland is to create a sense of belonging and for people to have a safe space to come with their families, to roller skate, scooter, bike, and see one another, but in a safe, socially distant space was exactly what we needed as a city during this very frightening time. But we didn't stop there. We went back to those communities and asked how this intervention was working for them. Whether these slow streets were creating a sense of community, a sense of safety, an outlet for exercise and for mental health. And in some neighborhoods, these were celebrated. In others, the communities felt like we really weren't addressing their greater need. And so we iterated, we pivoted very quickly in response to what we heard from the community. So in some of our neighborhoods, neighborhoods that were lower income, neighborhoods that have been traditionally our Black and Latino neighborhoods, they had more concerns about being able to get to the most important places in the neighborhood safely. 
the neighborhood grocery stores, the neighborhood laundromats that so many people still needed to go to to keep clothes clean. Uh, and, and of course, very important during COVID, uh, pharmacies. And so we created something called Essential Streets. And we used just our basic orange safety cones to create a slowdown at crosswalks in major areas that we knew had high incidence of traffic accidents so that people could walk more safely to get to the essential places that they needed to. I hope I get a chance to talk more about the other ways that we liberated our streets from cars and gave them back to the people as well as to commerce and culture uh, Max said earlier that people used to see cities as the villains in climate change, and now we are the heroes. I'd like to say that about our roads. When you look from space, the surface of Oakland, the surface, one quarter of it is roads. How are we using that incredible gift that belongs to our whole community? before roads were really villains of health with traffic accidents and pollution and a worse quality of life. Now we are seeing roads as heroes, places where people can exercise, be more healthy, be in community. And we're starting to see these slow streets host little uh, community gardens with, with herb gardens for the whole block. We're seeing small marketplaces pop up and celebrations of culture. So that is what I hope we can see uh, is, is our roads become our, our health heroes. That is an opportunity that COVID gave us. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Schaff, for giving us a, a little bit of a, a picture of how Oakland reuse the streets how you service different communities differently, depending on their needs for, for public space. And I'm sure Mac will dig into that with you uh, later. Uh, before we turn to the uh, moderated discussion, and I leave you all in Max good hands momentarily, I'd like to launch a poll uh, to the audience, to, to those who are viewing in. To, to find out how you're thinking, how you experienced uh, public space where you live. So what are, uh, what area of public space has changed the most in your city due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Reduced traffic in central business districts due to teleworking, expanded bike lanes, additional green space, uh, expanded access uh, to outdoor space for dining, recreation, pedestrians, cultural activities. And if you have other um, examples of how public space was used, please, uh, please let us know using the chat function. Tell us, tell us more. Um, we still have, we'll keep it open for another, let's say 15 uh, seconds while uh, folks let us know how public space, what area of public space changed, transformed the most in your city due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it looks like uh, we have a front runner, but we'll give it a maybe five more seconds. Can we close the panel, please? Uh, the poll, please. So reduced traffic in the central business district due to teleworking. So we were speaking before about uh, the possibility of hybrid models changing, um, changing our use of central business districts and the commercial areas. And it seems like uh, people are in agreement, followed by expanded access to outdoor space uh, for dining, recreation, pedestrians, and culture. And I'm Hope you all are taking advantage of the use of roads, as uh, uh, Mayor Schaff said, in, in recreation. Expanded bike lanes uh, that resulted, uh, hopefully, in reduced uh, car traffic and additional green spaces. And uh, so with this, thank you all for participating in this poll. With this, 
I give the floor to Mac to start in the, the moderated discussion with our panelists. Uh, thanks again, Senna, and thanks to the mayors. There are uh, fascinating examples that we can kind of build on uh, in this uh, discussion. So, you know, one thing about COVID was that it, um, it really brought some long-standing urban problems into sharper contrast, right? So in other words, you might think of COVID as just another overlay that we put on the map to kind of describe or illustrate the cost of inequality. Um, and if you look at the spatial kind of organization of COVID and COVID mortality, it, it overlays almost perfectly with all sorts of other kind of negative consequences of inequality, whether it's the experience of urban heat island effects, or whether it's just kind of uh, the location of, of the people who are poorly housed or impoverished, or what the, you know, the World Bank calls compounded risks, right? But the, you know, not only did COVID expose a lot of urban vulnerabilities, but it also generated some myths that we're gonna have to deal with as we look forward. And one of the biggest myths was this idea that it's actually urban density that is the problem, not a, a solution. And that um, we have to kind of come to grips with the fact that dense development leaves us really exposed to, um, uh, to pandemics. And you know, as it turns out, if you look at the data, um, some of the densest urban areas in the world did not experience really high uh, degrees of uh, COVID mortality. And that's because uh, of the way we behaved, not because of the way we organized ourselves in space. And so this is kind of a, a kind of, a, you know, a warning that, and this also is something that's been echoed by the World Bank, where they say that cities' plans to recover and rebuild from COVID-19 must strive to address long-standing vulnerabilities and go beyond addressing the health impacts of COVID to tackle the persistent inequalities that the poor and vulnerable contend with on a daily basis. So for us, it's really important that we get our responses right because we don't wanna create the next unanticipated negative consequence that we'll need to deal with in the future. And we don't wanna just build whatever we're gonna build post COVID, uh, new, uh, new structures on kind of faulty uh, foundations. So with that, yeah, I want to turn to the mayors and, and you know, just ask about investments that you're making in your public spaces and what are the important investments you made in your public spaces that your, your, your city has made in response to the pandemic? And how do you think you're going to be able to sustain those investments after people kind of forget about the panic and the worry that was associated with COVID? And so um, we'll start with... Uh, Mayor uh, Kalish Rotem uh, from Haifa. You, I know you, you talked a little bit about uh, recovering your uh, waterfront. Um, and I'm wondering, are there other plans to really change the spatial orientation in a more permanent way that are gonna help to address not just COVID vulnerabilities, but other, other kind of longstanding vulnerabilities in your community? Yeah, um, I think uh, in in uh, a few levels, uh, I can I can I, I will try to answer in few uh, in a few ways. Um, first, uh, all our uh, urban uh, renewal plans have changed uh, dramatic dramatically the way we see uh, uh, space. Uh, the mixed use, for example, which is not something very uh, popular in, in Israel. Uh, is now in every plan in Haifa. Uh, I, I actually took all the plans and started, um, you know, we, we all, we nearly started them um, um, fresh and um, a mixed use, uh, multi-layered city for me is uh, something that I cannot even imagine. I'm also an architect and urban planner. Uh, so um, all these high-rise uh, neighborhoods and uh, parking lots were, you know, um, uh, thrown away, all these plans. And uh, we are talking about uh, mixed use. We're talking about public transportation. We're talking about uh, streets and uh, walkability and distances. Uh, we're, uh, we're now working on... Um, uh, all sorts of uh, um, working centers of, of uh, 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 districts that uh, people can work uh, close to their neighborhoods and um, perhaps need less cars uh, per family. Uh, so uh, these were significant and very, very deep changes uh, in the way we started dealing with planning uh, issues. 
so uh, I think this is one thing. We're talking about really sustainable planning. Uh, we're talking about um, walking distances. Uh, we, for example, uh, it was we, we started doing it before COVID-19, but uh, we we um, got the approval from uh, the uh, uh, from government uh, to reduce taxes uh, to people who work from their houses. Uh, their offices are part of their apartment, uh, which is something very new here. Uh, in Israel, uh, because I would like to um, encourage um, uh, these uh, sustainable way of living. And I know that for many people, especially if they, are, um, they hold some creative uh, enterprise, uh, they get a lot of help with uh, taxes. Um, so uh, we had all sorts of uh, projects like that. Uh, but I think the most, um, let's say, uh, even banal, uh, things, but they were uh, a, a great, uh, I don't know, event. They were hype because uh, we just took uh, um, the street furniture, very simple street furniture that uh, you can find in forests and places like that. We took them and we just painted them uh, in all sorts of colors. And we started um, just, you know, throwing them in all sorts of streets and, and public uh, places and usually near small businesses. And then we just hanged a few lights above to add a little more light to the place. And it was just a, a crazy uh, event because all sorts, all, all of a sudden, all sorts of uh, streets uh, changed significantly and no more cars. And, and I think the most uh, amazing thing happened um, that happened in our city is that people used to go to the shopping mall. It was like, that was, that was the place to go, to shop. And all of a sudden, we see more and more people on the streets. Uh, so for me, um, that, was, uh, that, that was actually my, um, my, my dream. Uh, but seeing it happen, and um, uh, in a way, because of COVID-19, or it happened uh, um, more, um, it, it happened more, uh, more quickly. Uh, it was an amazing thing to do. Uh, we also had um, other projects. Uh, it's a cashback project. Uh, we give uh, um, some small payment back to the people of Haifa who shop in local uh, uh, businesses. So you, you get a refund if you buy at local businesses. So uh, this is our way to help uh, promote our small businesses and and help the economy in a way which was uh, severely damaged, of course, in this year. Well, I don't know. There are many uh, more. No, no, thanks. That, that's uh, that was super helpful. So, um, you know, Mayor Schaff, um, back in the uh, you know the economic crisis of two thousand nine and ten, we uh, were, were frequently uh, you know people were frequently heard saying. Or crisis is a terrible thing to waste, um, and why don't we use a crisis as an opportunity to, to do something new? And you've already mentioned that you've been able to kind of reclaim your streets in Oakland uh, as a result of kind of the reduction in traffic and all that. But I'm wondering, um, what else did COVID do to give you kind of the space to think more creatively? And will the will that creative those creative changes sustain, or are they going to be? You know, when the cars come back, are we going to have to be now contesting the use of those streets again. We are committed to keeping these changes where our residents want them. And that is such an important part of this process is to be in authentic communication with all your communities because different communities might feel differently. That was something we learned very early on. Uh, another thing that happened during COVID that we had not planned, that we did not ask for, because the slow streets, you know, that was our program. We were excited about it. But you, you see in my virtual background, Lake Merritt, which is literally on the edge of our downtown, as well as a residential district. Well, it felt like the whole world needed to hang out at Lake Merritt. <laughs> and as people were desperate, people lost their jobs during COVID. We saw overnight a marketplace pop up on Lake Merritt. 
And let's be honest, it caused conflicts. Uh, we started having traffic jams. We had unpermitted food and you know propane takes and barbecues and rock concerts <laughs> going on in our beautiful park uh, without the benefit of you know governmental regulation. Uh, but also during COVID, uh, we as government wanted to give grace. And what I mean by that is, uh, particularly after the murder of George Floyd by a police officer, actually one year ago, exactly yesterday, uh, this idea of, of government uh, as, as a enforcer uh, it was something we were very sensitive to. And so we took that new love and attraction to our lake and the green spaces around it. And we worked with it. Uh, we worked with the Black Vendors Association to actually do permits for them at no cost and to move this commercial activity to a part of the lake where it wouldn't cause uh, traffic conflicts. In fact, we shut down a whole street to create a new marketplace there. Uh, and so those are the kinds of things that we've had to do during COVID. But, but another gift is a, a mind shift of government as an enabler, as someone who actually takes what the community wants and does not say no, but says, this is how you can do this activity without unreasonably impacting the other stakeholders that also have a right to this public space. Uh, and so the, the commercial uh, implications of public space, the cultural implications of public space, uh, we try to welcome them and manage them and not shut them down. And not to mention the health implications of outdoor space as we found that uh, it's very uh, low probability that COVID could be spread outdoors, right? So it's good to get people outdoors and interacting. And, that, so, and that's why we didn't want to shut it down. Although we, were, we did say to people like, give the lake a break, try your slow street, you know, try and go someplace else. Cause it, it was pretty overwhelming at one point, I'll say. So Mary Vallo in, in Bratislava, you have a very kind of uh, interesting uh, kind of geographic position. Cause you're there kind of very close to Vienna, very close to Hungary, very, you know, straddling the Danube. And I'm wondering, you know, so a couple of questions for you. One thing that we saw in the United States uh, after uh, COVID was uh, this tendency for um, public space to become kind of flexibly used space where like restaurants would spill out onto streets and start building, you know, igloos and tables for people to eat at and um, uh, parking spaces to be taken up uh, by other, um, you know, small business uses and all that. But the other thing we saw is, of course, a complete change in the commercial employment orientation where everybody was working at a distance. And I'm wondering, to what extent have you seen a much more flexible orientation of your citizens in Bratislava to all those things? No longer having to commute into Vienna, being able to work at home, now demanding more local services, thinking about more flexible uses of land around them. Is that something that's, that's been happening or... Is this something you're anticipating that's going to happen as you move forward? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, Bratislava has unofficially around 600,000 uh, citizens, inhabitants. And uh, there is nearly zero rate uh, unemployed. Uh, there is uh, zero unemployment rate in Bratislava, and this is also true that part of people are working in Vienna, which is forty-five minutes by train, which is like for in the scale of America of the United States is like one city. Uh, but the, the main possibilities to work are in Bratislava. You you need to understand that we have uh, one of the European headquarters of Dell or IBM or HP in Bratislava, a lot of people are very used, uh, already work at home and doing uh, the teleworking, telework. So, so what happened in Bratislava that like, uh, the first thing I need to say that we took 
the COVID very seriously from, from the first day, not only the city, but mainly our citizens. So our main, main outcome uh, is that we have just fantastic people which are be able to be super disciplined. And in fact, uh, we were one of the best um, capital cities in Europe in term, after the first wave in terms of, of a number of deaths or, or, um, or people who were sick with COVID. And, and so, and when I'm talking about this, you need to also understand the environment where uh, in we, which we are using the public space. And you, between the second uh, 1947 and 1989, it was a totalitarian regime uh, where the regime was dictating how, when we are going to use the public space. The public space, which is not only our outdoor living room, but is mainly the place for democracy for me. And I saw as a child, the Velvet Revolution in Bratislava. I saw it in, in the squares where before it was uh, nobody um, was prohibited to be there. And, and uh, uh, in one moment, there was uh, 100,000 people in the, in the square. So for us as uh, public space, also this uh, kind of special meaning. And we, we and, and it's also true, uh, that uh, we also start to do all the things also um, uh, other cities are doing to be very flexible, uh, flexible in use of public space. For example, we are giving for free uh, double. If restaurant has a terrace, uh, outdoor dining, we are giving it uh, now this year, also last year for free, and we are doubling it. So of course they can be outdoor and all, all these small, small, uh, small helps we can uh, we can give them. But the thing is that we there wasn't big pressure mainly in the first wave to to be outdoor. The people were so caution, so disciplined. They were just home, you know, and and, and that was incredible. And maybe you saw it. There was uh, around the internet this uh, crazy pictures from a super empty Bratislava, like it was very empty for really first two, three months from February to May, 2020. Of course, the second wave was very much more difficult because uh, people are already fed up and they just want to live their lives. And, uh, and, and now uh, we have a very good rate of vaccination. So it's uh, happening, but I, and we, our main uh, goal was to protect uh, our, our people. And there was the two groups was elderly people and uh, our homeless people. And of course, this is also connected with public space because uh, we are promoting public space for elderly people. And one of their key elements of their lives is going to walk outside together in groups and have some culture. And we had very strict uh, rules uh, starting in February, 2020. Uh, there was no, of course, no visits, no, uh, because we have uh, uh, 1,200 clients in all their elderly centers. So uh, what we did, we organized a concert for these uh, elderly people under the balconies, you know, outside concert, they were looking at it from the windows for their balconies. This is a small thing. This was a small interaction in public space. They cannot walk in the public space, but they can live what is happening in public space through the music, for example. And of course, we built a quarantine city, a small city for a city, as a small uh, center for in the first wave was for uh, 400 people in the second wave, which was much worse in the end for 200 people, for uh, homeless people, because they, if they were became thick, they don't have place to go and they became a threat for themselves, also for others. So th this is, uh, th these are the areas where, where we were really concentrating ourselves. What is it? And of course, uh, what we did was uh, cleaning less and order of public areas, new sanitation points and all the, all the stuff, testing, you know, maybe you know it, but Slovakia was one of the most tested country in the world. We, we, had, uh, we had like, uh, like a lot of uh, uh, test, uh, testing going on, it was all free. And uh, uh, me as a mayor, I was tested nearly during the first few months, nearly every day. But what is important, I want to go back to, the, to what um, my fellow colleagues say, Mayor Chef, 
about the, the opportunities. And for me, I'm the, uh, the one of the, my main program was fight the cars. That's the, that's the problem of the East European, Central European city. Uh, the cars, cars are everywhere. Uh, they are parked everywhere. Many people are using cars, and and I'm doing it. And it's everybody who is in this business as as me knows that it's not very popular. Uh, that it's very difficult to explain to people that car is not the right. The parking space is not the this human right, you know. <laughs> and that the, the trees are better. And everybody wants a tree be, instead of public space, but it cannot be in front of their house houses, you know. So it's. And, and the COVID give us opportunity to show to people the streets and the city without the cars. And that's something, uh, I think that this is something very important that people understand, okay, we can have this street and maybe there don't need to be the cars all the time on the street because, you know, car traffic was, was going down. And this, is, this was very, something very interesting for us. So, so that actually brings up an interesting point because, um, one of the big uh, losers in the um, uh, in the COVID uh, pandemic was um, public transportation, and in almost every city in the world, public transportation ridership fell by 50, 60, in some cases 90 percent. And it's it's starting to come back a little bit, but it's still and there, there's real concerns whether even public transportation systems are ever going to be economic again because of uh, of these problems. So. How do, how do you all imagine people getting around your cities now? Is there a new kind of multi-mode uh, kind of transport systems in your heads? Or are there uh, a lot more ride sharing? I mean, what, we're, how are we gonna uh, move people around or are we just gonna try to keep them in 15 minute neighborhoods walking around being able to kind of uh, live, you know, uh, get everything they need within a 15 minute walk? I don't know. So um, why don't we start with, with you, uh, Mayor Schaff? Uh, what are you thinking about how people are gonna get around your city? We think people will come back to using public transit. And we recognize during COVID that many of our workers had to take public transit. Uh, and it really showed us where our essential workers are living and working because there were certain transit lines that even during the worst time of the pandemic were still being used a lot. Uh, in fact, we had to uh, reduce service because of the funding, the, the revenue impacts. And we've had problems where the buses have had to leave people still waiting <laughs> at the bus stop because they had already taken up the maximum allowed healthy number of people to be inside the bus. So, so we are not seeing a drop off of use especially with our lower wage, lower income workers who rely on public transit. And so it, it is helping us as we build back the system, thinking about equity, thinking about who is dependent on our transit system versus who chooses to use it when it's most convenient for them. Uh, and so that's the kind of work we're going to continue to do. Uh, I think all of our cities are having a, a, an equity reckoning uh, to really recognize that we have not invested enough in certain neighborhoods, in our low income neighborhoods. We have not done enough to dismantle systems of uh, institutionalized racism uh, and, and that is work that Oakland is very passionate about. And systemic racism is also in our public transit systems. And this has given us an opportunity to learn more about how we can change that. So I'm excited about the return to public transit. I, I sit on the region's transportation authority, so the the whole Bay Area is 101 cities in nine counties. Uh, again, that 8 million people uh, uh, number. Uh, so we are working to also create a more integrated system because the different cities have had different public transportation systems. And that is another opportunity in COVID where we really saw the need to integrate all those systems to be more seamless as workers are 
being forced to live farther and farther away from job centers because of the high cost of housing in our core cities. So that is um, really our work ahead. Uh, but COVID gave us some very valuable information about who is transit dependent so that we can serve them first and best. So how about Haifa, Mayor Kalish Rotem? What is, the, what is the future of transport there? Um, it's a, a very important issue. Uh, of course, when the city was in the lock, lockdown, there was no public uh, transit at all. It was uh, stopped. But uh, most of the people who were forced to continue working, like for example, in hospitals, uh, nurses and, and, and you know so many people in the hospitals and they needed the public transportation. And we had um, a, a, a serious issue uh, with, um, uh, with, with, with the way uh, to uh, help these people move around and get to the work because they were uh, really crucial uh, in what they did. Uh, so that was in the first uh, phase of, of the pandemic and the lockdown. Uh, we were lucky because we, uh, we started some initiative just before, um, before the beginning of the pandemic uh, with um, a actually very interesting idea that uh, we developed together with the, the bus company uh, in the city, in Haifa. Um, it's uh, very small buses that uh, stop only uh, in bus stops, but they have very flexible lines. And you just call them uh, with your cell phone and uh, they can uh, host, I don't know, uh, they can accommodate uh, five to 10 people, that's all. So it's like a taxi, but it's a little more sophisticated. It works uh, through the mobile um, cell phone and uh, it only works on bus stops. So uh, we started that initiative and it just saved us during the pandemic uh, because uh, these were uh, very small um, vehicles uh, that just took maybe one or two people uh, because, you know, uh, people could not enter uh, the same space together. They just help, helped us to move uh, people, especially those who uh, were uh, in, um, uh, um, um, how do you say, um, important uh, uh, jobs, uh, especially in the hospitals. Uh, we also opened uh, places for kindergartens for the people in the hospitals, for the doctors and the nurses. Uh, so we tried to look after their children. So uh, we just, we, we, all we did was to see how we help the people who, who had to go to work. So that what, that's one thing. And the, the idea of small buses that, that have flexible lines uh, was just an enormous thing for us during the pandemic. And it still works now um, in Israel. Most of the people are vaccinated and uh, now um, we can say that the pandemic is, is, is in a very uh, low, uh, I don't know, nearly, I think we only have 19 uh, people uh, uh, in, in the city with, uh, with the disease. So um, um, now everybody is, and every, everybody is getting back to life. And uh, this uh, system, this uh, transit system is uh, just um, an amazing thing. Everybody got used to it and everybody loves it. Uh, another thing that we're uh, starting to do and uh, we missed, uh, we, we did not manage to do it during uh, the pandemic, but uh, we set and we started doing all the plans and now we're on it is uh, to put escalators in all sorts of places. Haifa is built on, uh, on, on the slope of a mountain, uh, quite a high mountain and many neighborhoods are you know, sitting in, in different uh, levels. And uh, the city center has, we have all sorts of centers and they are uh, divided. And now we're starting to connect all sorts of places uh, within the city with escalators. Uh, so that was also something we realized we need to do uh, during the pandemic and uh, hopefully no more pandemics uh, for at least the next century. <laughs> but uh, we, hope, we hope that uh, we will have uh, more 
um, uh, accessibility opportunities for people. Yeah, the, uh, um, in Medellin, they did a, did a great job with escalators as a way to connect neighborhoods as well. And it made a gigantic difference of, of really being able to introduce neighborhoods that have been kind of locked out of economic opportunity to find their way into the mainstream. And it was just, a, it was one physical kind of intervention that made all the difference, right? So that's, it's interesting. Um, so what about Bratislava? What is your uh, transport uh, situation? Are you looking at um, this last mile connectivity with these small buses that they have in Haifa? That sounds like an interesting model to take a look at, huh? I mean, I mean, it's definitely an interesting model, but we are doing something else. The funny story is that we just finished the, during the first days of, of lockdown in the second wave, uh, in second wave, in mostly part of, of the Europe was uh, between September and and uh, and now, actually, uh, we were opening the the reconstructed very important tram line, uh, which cost us sixty million of euros, and I was opening it with the uh, with the public and everything during the first uh, just one one day before the lockdown. So imagine. Uh, all these are hopes and are uh, we are very looking forward it we have a tram during the peak hour which is coming every two minutes which is which is uh, very good and and we during the the worst month we have uh, minus 80 percent in our public transport of people and uh, now we are still losing two and uh, two and a half million euros of per month but we decided to pay it all, uh, not to stop, not to fire nobody, not to to use every everything we can to to hold on on, on of pub, on public transport because it's the for us it's the only way have to solve the uh, the cars problem. You know, there is no other way in Bratislava. We are a city um, with a historical center and we, we cannot make streets bigger and uh, we already know that making more space for cars mere, just mean more cars. So so we, and for us, the, the, the vaccination is the thing uh, where also we as a city uh, working a lot of uh, on the communication level and explaining that people need to be vaccinated because we are counting counting on the fact that in September we will uh, go back in the public transport in the much bigger numbers. And uh, again, it, it's never going to be. Of course, uh, it, it, we are it's never going to be uh, make a profit. But uh, but we want to people have back. And, and of course, what we did, we uh, the one year ticket, uh, we. We make made it uh, cheaper, twenty five percent. So, so we we also working on the level of money, and and now uh, we hope we are working a lot of on public transportation, uh, cameras in every buses, every tram, the 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 air condition in every every car, a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of uh, new things. Uh, and of course, it's all stopped by pandemic, but we are continuing to do that. And I still believe we, after the pandemic, we can uh, restart our public transportation. So Senna, um, I, you know, as you know, I could talk all day um, and uh, I'm happy to do so, but should I be moving on to the next poll question or should I ask one more question for the mayors? We can ask oh, one more question and then we can move to the poll. Okay. So, um, so, so mayors, uh, one of the reasons, I think this is about 15 years ago now that um, my first encounter with OECD was at this uh, uh, meeting that we uh, hosted in Chicago called Mayors and Ministers. And one of the things that uh, the OEC, OECD, if you don't know, was uh, at the time almost entirely focused on, the, on national governments and national government ministers were really kind of the folks that they cared most about. But they they realized how important it was to try to find alignment between local governments and national governments. And in order to do that, they had to initiate conversations. And so um, it's interesting to me to think about now, kind of after 15 years later, we've had these really, really productive conversations between local governments and national governments, and sometimes intermediated by, say, state governments in places like the United States. And so I'm wondering, uh, from your point of view, as you now kind of emerge, into this new era of possibilities that have been opened up by COVID, the pandemic, um, the new flows of resources that are coming down. What do you need from your national government 
to enable you to do your best work at the local level? How can the national government or the state governments in the United States really kind of help you do what you need to do to serve your uh, constituents, your residents the best? And um, um, we'll start with um, we'll start with you, Mayor uh, Kalish uh, Rodem. Um, how can the national government uh, in Israel help you to to serve Haifa the best? Um, I would say something, but I, I, I'm quite serious. Uh, I would ask them just to not interfere. Um, I think that uh, we know we know our people, we know the problems, we know uh, very well what they need. Uh, sometimes when um, our national or central government, they came up with all sorts of um, bylaws and, and you know, demands, and they were just not right for the city or the people of the city or all sorts of situations that turned out to be um, ridiculous. Uh, so we had to somehow to adjust uh, between um, bylaws that, you know, they had their sense of, of, of value and they they had some uh, logic uh, but when it can when it came into um, in, uh, to practice uh, we sometimes felt very big gaps so I would say just you know give us the direction and not interfere that's one thing and the other is to um, open the budgets <laughs> And uh, for example, to uh, uh, put these uh, uh, street furniture, to change the lighting in the streets uh, so people can um, 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 go into new places uh, at, at, during hours that they were not used to. Um, um, open all sorts of services to people in very uh, small scale uh, not to you know to tens of people, but to uh, individuals. Uh, these things cost money, and uh, uh, we needed more support uh, when it came to that. Uh, not I'm not even uh, talking about the small businesses that um, we we started some initiatives to to help them uh, because they were in a very very bad state. Uh, so helping the economy. Uh, so there was a lot of tension be be uh, between uh, the central government in Israel and all the uh, local uh, municipalities. Uh, I think um, eventually everybody said that uh, the local government uh, was, um, was doing a magnific magnificent job because uh, we are connected to people, we're connected to the streets and uh, we see people, we talk to them, we know what they want. Uh, we have, um, you know, a, a free way to, to, to discuss, to see, to, to talk to them. Uh, so um, I think at some point they just realized that in our central government uh, and just let, uh, gave us more and more freedom. Um, so that was more or less the process. Flexibility is always a good thing. And, and flexibility has been a theme that's been running through this entire conversation of flexible land uses, flexible kinds of thinking that we need to do. And, and that's, that's good. Flexibility from the national government would be a good thing too. So how about in Slovakia? How can the Slovakian government help you, Mayor uh, Valo, to um, you know, really do your best to serve the folks of Bratislava? I mean, what is absolutely, mm, yeah. What is absolutely amazing for me, and I uh, think I'm, I'm, I'm part of the Bloomberg's uh, network of mayors, so uh, I have a lot of contacts with mayors from different uh, part of wards that the, the exact words mayor of Haifa just said are my words. It's, it's exactly like this, even if Haifa is all in a, uh, another part of, of, the, of the world or on different part of the world, I mean, the situation was exactly the same. Just not interfere, that, that's important for us. Just, we know what to do. We are close to the citizen. They are always asking us questions. They, they're never going to meet our prime minister in the street, but they're every day meeting me in the street, you know, they're yeah. mayor. So, so that's the small, small thing you can, you, you already know that the, the level and the scale of our involvement is just different. 
And of course, the, the conflict, which uh, now was evident between central government and local municipalities was, was clear and was also clear that we, and I don't want to sound too big about it, but we saved the situation during the COVID, definitely. The municipalities saved the situation with testing, with communication. There wasn't very good campaign from, uh, from uh, our uh, central government. And uh, with, the, with uh, the understanding of the, the real, uh, real uh, needs of our citizens, which is we are just more close to the, to the people and not interfere. And in my case, in case of Bratislava, we need more power in, uh, in deciding what, how we are going direct traffic in our cities. Just a small example which is absurd. If I want to do a bus lane uh, or a bicycle lane, I need uh, a state police for that. They need to give me permission. And it, it taking a month to have this permission. So I'm not, I can't, I'm the one of the cities which cannot say that we create a kilometers of new uh, bike lanes because it's just not true because we, we need a permission of our state, of our government. And they just looking always old school in an old school way, they're just looking on the cars. They need to move the cars. People are not interesting for them. So, so this is it. And uh, exact the same words. Thank you very much. So, Mayor Schaaf, same question to you. What can the U.S. government or the California government do for Oakland to help you serve your population? Well, let me just say, at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, Donald Trump was the president. He was the most evil, horrible leader that the United States has ever had. He hated cities. Uh, he tried to put me in jail personally, like by name. Uh, so we did not feel any support from the national government. Uh, and, and I will give credit to our governor of California, Gavin Newsom, who really did help California get through those first critical months of the pandemic. And when we talk about the public space, um, another benefit of not having cars around is we stood up huge testing sites and then vaccination sites in parking lots, in city owned parking lots. Uh, but we just had to go and raise the money privately, figure out how to stand them up because the, the federal government was not a help at all at the beginning of the pandemic. Now we had an election and now we have a new president. And oh my God, if you had any questions about the power of democracy, look at the United States of America because we now have a president who is providing tremendous support to cities. And when we think about what a, an equitable recovery looks like, uh, I appreciate that President Joe Biden and his vice president, who we are very proud was born in Oakland, California, Kamala Harris, uh, their slogan is build back better. And our federal government is for the first time making unprecedented amounts of money available directly to cities. Um, I also want to just thank the other mayors uh, during the first part of the pandemic, the mayors of the 13 largest cities in California, and that includes, you know, Los Angeles and Sacramento and uh, San, San Jose and San Diego, San Francisco, uh, we, we did a Zoom call every single night, seven days a week for the wow. first several months because we were not getting help from our national government. So we helped each other with good ideas, with lobbying the state for resources and assistance. One great thing the state of California did, I know uh, Mayor uh, was, was talking about helping the homeless population because tourism stopped in our cities. We had these hotels that were empty. Well, we turned those in to shelter for our homeless people. Uh, we got thousands of people off the streets right at the beginning of COVID by utilizing hotels. So, um, but, but now we're in such a better place uh, having the national government 
actually trying to help cities rather than hating cities uh, makes a world of difference. That's interesting. In the absence of vertical alignment with the national government, you want the horizontal alignment across the cities in your state, which is which is good. And hopefully that will persist even after the, the alignment with the national government gets restored. But I guess the, the, the motto from this part of the discussion is uh, we should have a Hippocratic oath for um, national governments first do no harm, right? <laughs> and then we'll, we'll see what else we can do that, to be helpful, right? All right, Senna, I think it's time to turn to the, uh, to the poll question number two. And I guess uh, somebody will put it up on the screen and I'll kind of read out. So this is the, here's the question. What is your city's biggest challenge to reorient, reorienting public space? Uh, and you got to pick one. Uh, the built environment, in other words, updating infrastructure, mixed use development, street design. Number two, dependency on private vehicles. Number three, regulations and permitting. In other words, outdoor dining, micro mobility, operator registration. Um, number uh, four, lack of public domain. In other words, converting vacant lots to green space, converting empty commercial space to housing or other. If you have another, you're going to have to describe it in the chat for us. So we'll give you about, I don't know, 30 seconds to kind of make your choices here. And after those choices are made, they're going to pop up the results on the screen. And I'll tell you what the winner was of those or reorienting public space challenges. Vote early, vote often. Get in there. Okay, do we have a do we have results? Here we go. The biggest challenge is the built environment, updating infrastructure, mixed use development, street design. Not a surprise. I mean, everybody knows we've had an infrastructure crisis ongoing for the last 40 years globally, and I guess it's time to maybe address it. And maybe we'll be able to summon the political will to do so now that people are, are focused on it. So thank you all for uh, your votes. And then uh, now, Senator, do we want to turn to questions from the audience? Yes, exactly. And I have a few uh, lined up that have come through uh, the Q&A form. And this one is for all mayors. Uh, we've heard a bit from Mayor Ballo uh, about some interruptions to uh, investments that have been planned and even executed during COVID, in particular the transit um, line that he uh, that they built and lifted and opened and launched right before the pandemic. And we are wondering. Uh, a question comes in about what uh, else? Uh, what were you? What are you looking to uh, reinstate? Uh, what projects and programs are you looking to um, ignite again uh, post pandemic that were maybe interrupted uh, that are particularly um, uh, aligned to how you use uh, public space? And uh, could I ask uh, Mary Kalish Rotem if there's anything that has been interrupted that you are ready to get back into as, as a part of, because of COVID? Um, I think I, I started uh, with the saying that um, when I uh, stepped into office, we started with large scale projects, with master plans and with uh, rethinking about the structure, uh, the transportation and the uh, renewal of uh, the city and, uh, and most of its uh, neighborhoods. And of course, we are eager to um, continue with that. Uh, not everybody was working. It was uh, um, this year um, actually um, made it uh, more difficult to promote uh, these projects. Although I have to say that uh, the, the Zoom, uh, um, um, this uh, brilliant uh, thing just, um, uh, first, managed to uh, uh, put every, uh, to, to uh, uh, bring everybody close together as, as we do now. Uh, so uh, we also continued working on the long term and the la large scale projects. And of course, this is what we want to do. I have to say that uh, the pandemic um, uh, taught me that uh, all the things we wanted to promote before. Are, uh, are are relevant 
the mixed use, the sustainable development, the public transportation. Uh, of course, uh, there were changes. We now, uh, we, we, less, we, we don't enjoy being in crowds at the moment. Uh, there is uh, some, some uh, psychological um, fear of being in crowds. So we look more at small places, uh, placemaking. Um, in every neighborhood, we, we wanted to do something very small for um, a very um, uh, small group of people uh, who, can, who can use the places. So I think the scale is a little different, but um, the sustainable um, uh, ideas, the, sus the sustainable development ideas are relevant more than ever. And uh, what we are uh, all willing to do is to return to normal life and continue working as hard as we can to uh, promote all the things that we started before the pandemic. Thank you, Mayor Kalishwadam. And uh, I go to Mayor Vallo. Uh, you mentioned the transport uh, being interrupted, but what are, you, what are your hopes for uh, what public space looks like in Bratislava now and, and in the future? What, what are you hoping for? Uh, thank you very much. One of our biggest investment uh, during this year and next year is in the public space. What we are actually doing, we are creating a lot of different new plazas or piazzetti. We call we are calling it a new. We have a new bench, a special bench, with a, as a gift from Prague. There are only two cities in the world with this uh, special design bench. So all all the stuff was very important for us also before, and we are investing in it. And of course, as I mentioned, I'm an architect. I'm an architect. So the public space was always. Uh, changing during the history uh, with different limitation because of some action or because of some uh, uh, thing which happened. But in the end, uh, my hopes are clear. I already seeing it. People want to go back to public space. There will be, of course, some, uh, some uh, COVID limitation, some fears. The thing will be maybe a little bit slower, but in the end, People will be back in public space. Uh, that that's for sure. I mean, if I'm only imagine that how people were sad, not angry, just sad when we cancel our Christmas market, which is the beautiful one month Christmas market, also which is also in different cities in every city. People are looking forward, even if we have uh, we we have different kind of weathers, not only hot summer people want to be they want to be outside it's important for them so so uh, and i think uh, uh, that that's it that's the, my answer sorry thank you mayor valo and mayor chef uh, last question to you before we end here uh, the the q and a generated a lot of questions on your slow siege slow streets program and as well as um, how you engaged with residents to understand their needs. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, how you use the feedback from residents and how you will be using it to adapt uh, the physical space? Sure. Oakland is very fortunate to have a lot of nonprofit organizations, non-governmental uh, organizations that are doing work deep in communities. And we've made an effort to not just work with the big ones, but some of the really small ones that, that particularly connect with very unique groups like uh, African immigrants is, is one group of Oaklanders that we want to be able to hear from. Uh, but we did something very old fashioned uh, as politicians, it's familiar to us but it's something that city government doesn't always do. We actually uh, created a door hanger with a survey uh, and, and put it on people's doorknobs because we couldn't knock on doors and talk. Uh, that that makes, made people very uncomfortable. We used these, these door hangers. And uh, even during COVID, we got more participation in residents from our lower income neighborhoods uh, the traditional neighborhoods with people of color 
uh, to propose capital improvement projects in their neighborhoods. Uh, so I was excited to see more engagement. Uh, even as we moved our, our public meetings from in-person at City Hall to on Zoom, we actually saw more people participate in city government because now we have digital connection and more people are connected. So those were some of the great advances for hearing from people. We also created uh, very simple textable surveys. Uh, so not requiring an internet connection, but actually could be done by a simple text message exchange. That was another tool we used. And we used the slow streets to kind of advertise how people, because obviously people who are at the slow street are going to have opinions about them. So we put the signs about where to take the uh, public opinion survey on the slow street uh, barriers. So that worked very well also. Those were some of the things we use and we're gonna continue uh, because it is so important to have this dialogue with your community and to recognize that different parts of your city may feel very differently about a particular program or intervention. Thank you, Mayor Schaff. Thank you, Mayor Vallo. Thank you, Mayor Kelly Schrotem. Thank you, Mac for joining us today for Fit for the Future, day two of the Champion Mayor's Week, uh, more inclusion, better recovery. Well, I've certainly been convinced that the, uh, the things that are happening in cities, both big and small, uh, short-term, medium-term, and long-term have uh, are putting uh, residents at the center, 